Hi. Hi, everyone. And hi, Lori. And hi, Kelsey. Um, I'm Sarah Easterly. I'm an adoptee. And I am in community with, on a regular basis, um, Kelsey Vandervliet Ranyard, who is a birth parent. Hi, Kelsey. Hi. And Lori Holden, who's an adoptive parent, um, an adoptive mother. So, yes. and we are, we meet very regularly and um, it's been almost a year. I think we're coming up on a year that we've been meeting together and having really compelling conversations um, between the three of us. We've done a lot of writing together and then a lot of our meetings are around collaborating on our writing together, but then we end up for probably just as much time as we're working together, just talking industry, talking adoption, talking about all different facets of adoption. And it's remarkable being in community together because um, it, it's just a really, we don't have these personal um, ties in our stories and yet we are connected because um, we all represent three different important parts of the adoption triad, uh, the adoptee, myself, um, and then the birth parent and the adoptive parent. And so our perspectives when we bounce things around each other, um, it's really, it's eye-opening. It's, it's um, helped me for sure. It opens my mind all the time of things I hadn't thought of. And there's a way that um, in a kind of depersonalized setting, it can inform um, things that might feel very personal to me, were they to be with my immediate either birth family or adoptive family. And so, um, and I hope the same is true for you both. Um, and yeah, it's just refreshing. And so uh, we decided to record this conversation um, and start doing this regularly because there's so many times we think, oh my gosh, I wish we could share what we just talked about with others. And so that's what we're here to do today. And um, something we realized we had some energy for uh, the other day, a couple of days ago when we were talking was around names. And um, there's just a lot of a lot to unpack when it comes to names and, and how they affect us in each of our positions in the adoption constellation. So we'll start there. And um, yeah, I guess let's just jump right in. Kelsey, <laughs> I'm going to toss it to you. Uh, just, yeah. you know, we were talking the other day just about um, the complications around, um, you know, how to honor a name if a birth parent has an idea for a name and an adoptive family is wrestling with how to do that and just I'll just hand it over to you to just share your thoughts around it. Yeah so I worked at um, a couple agencies and law firms and adoption um, as well as my own personal experience and I've seen a lot of a lot of things a lot of situations and experiences that um, and and some just very preventable um, situations that where maybe an adoptive parent is really, really set on a name and the birth parent doesn't like that name or the birth parent is also really, really set on a name. And then there's just a clash that it could totally be avoidable. Um, I think that there's a lot of discussion on this topic and I think a lot of uh, people kind of sit on both sides of the fence that say like, no, the adoptive parent, that's their child. They get to choose the name. And then the other camp is like, no, you should always honor the birth parent's wishes with the name. And I feel like every time I sit myself in a black and white, like a corner of like absolutism, I am always within like very quickly shown that there is no black and white answer to these to these things and so there's just a whole lot of gray area um i've seen a situation where a birth parent really wanted to name their child something i'm not going to share that name just to preserve privacy but it it was really a bizarre name and it was um it was not gonna be easy for this child to go through school. Let's just say that it was not gonna be an easy name for them to live with every day and be called that. Um, and the adoptive parents didn't like it, but they were trying to respect that. And so they settled for this name being the middle name. Um, there was some clash as far as that not being the first name, but ultimately, and I, 
in my opinion, in, in a very child-centered manner, they gave them an appropriate first name and kept this as a middle name. And also that child, you know, has the option to choose their own one day. If that's what they choose to do, they can always change their name. But I think that having a piece of their birth family in their name at all is, um, I think it can be impactful, uh, but also we have to respect that child and their, um, you know, keep that child safe, I guess, from any potential bullying or harm that can be done by something that's preventable. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like what you said about the two extremes, Kelsey, because, yeah, you know, if you have it set up so that um, either the birth parent wins or with their, their way or the adoptive parent wins with their way, uh, then that's a, then there's a loser. And if there's a loser yeah. in the picture, then there's a loser in the picture. So if you can find a way to not make, to, to win, if you can look for a win-win like the people did with um, that unique name. Um, we talked about how this is, can be a both and instead of an either or. Yeah, I like what you just said there, Lori. And, um, and yeah, and a winner and a loser. And it's actually, I just wanna point out, it's not, it's not a winner adoptive parent or winner birth parent the loser is the child. Um, right. And so we have to remember that it's not, the child is the one uh, who has that loss um, when we can't come together or have a middle ground in some way. Right. Or I think you had an idea of a book that kind of illustrates the both and principle. What was that? Um, what was the name of that book? Yes, I will share it. I have it right here. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's called... Um, Alma and how she got her name by Juana Martinez Neal. And um, I love picture books, as, as you both know. I love children's books. It's one of my passions. Um, even as an adult, uh, I, I have a whole collection behind me and a lot, um, a lot that really resonate for kind of the child of me as, as an adoptee and speak to me. And this is one of them. Um, it moves me to tears every time I read it. Um, and I'll just I'll just share a little bit of it. Um, beautiful illustrations too. Alma Sofia Esperanza Jose Pura Candela had a long name. Too long, if you asked her. My name is so long, daddy. It never fits, Alma said. Come here, he said. Let me tell you the story of your name. Then you decide if it fits. And he starts with, Sophia was your grandmother, he began. She loved books, poetry, jasmine, flowers, and of course, me. She was the one who taught me how to read. Um, and there's a, a illustrated kind of photo of Sophia. And then she says, I love books and flowers and you too, daddy. I am Sophia. Esperanza was your great grandmother, he continued. She hoped to travel, but never left the city where she was born. Her only son grew up to cross the seven seas. Wherever her sailor son went, so did Esperanza's heart. The world is so big. I want to go see it, daddy. You and me together. I am Esperanza. And so the book continues on with, um, now here's Jose, his father, but all of her ancestors and the stories and their heart stories, they're all the way they're connected through these, um, not just genes, but, and not just names, but attachment, it's attachment. And, um, you know, this, this does get to me every time because this is, this is something as adoptees, we don't often have, we don't have these, um, the both. And so is there a way, I think I like that middle name example you used Kelsey, because um, it, it's in there, it's in a name. I mean, and, and why not have, you know, she's got multiple middle names here. Um, and, you know, sure, it makes a long name, but with the stories, we can make sense of that and really tie and ground our children um, to their history and their history goes in both directions. It's a family tree that goes on two sides. Um, and so I think naming is a beautiful way to start from the beginning, recognizing both of those and not creating a divide in the adoptee who, who will feel that 
when they're old enough to start feeling it and just get in the habit of, of honoring both. Yeah. Sarah, you also said um, just that you have to let me know if you, if this is something that you want to share, but you also mentioned something that like, it kind of broke my heart because just being a birth mom and how you wanted to know if your mother named you, if your birth mother named you. And do you want to share a little bit of that? Yeah. Yeah. I'm really glad you did. Cause I think that was a perfect example of where I'm so glad yeah. we talked, you know, like I was like, Oh, that healed me having that conversation. Um, yeah, we, um, yeah, I had shared that I was very, when I found my birth mother, um, and got into reunion, that was one of the, my top questions is, you know, had you held me and had you named me? And the answer to both sadly was no. Um, and that was a disappointment. It really was. Um, and it's, you know, I, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, I was, I, I was just disappointed. I can understand on a conscious level um, why that wouldn't have happened. And still, it still, it still hurt. Um, so yeah, birth parents perspective on that. <laughs> I really loved your perspective, Sarah, too, from an adoptive parent's standpoint of you naming your children, that those names were really important to you, that you'd had them in mind and that you, it would have been hard for you if you hadn't had the chance to name your children. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. And my children are biological to me. And, um, and I think it, that at the end of the day, doesn't matter. Like naming your kids is such an important part of that parenting and claiming yourself as a parent. It's like the, one of the first big decisions we make as parents, right. Um, <laughs> um, in that parenting journey. So, um, I, yeah, I mean, my children, um, their names are Violet and Olive, and those are family names on both sides of our family. They're, you know, if you go back far enough on both sides of the family, we can find that in their middle names as well. Um, my, my daughter is one of my youngest, her middle name is after my aunt, Eleanor. And, um, and so I get to tie into history through that. Um, and, you know, I named my kids pre-reunion, so they're tied to my adoptive family history, but there's a grounding still, because again, we come from both. And so it's this tethering that's happening through those, those namings and the, the, just the honoring that the, the ancestors and the role that they've all played to bring us to where, where we are. So, um, yeah. Because I think when adoptive parents, uh, especially if they're coming to the adoption table through infertility. There's so many losses, small and big losses up to that point. And to have that last one uh, about naming the child, which you might've been thinking about for decades, you know, since you were a little girl or a young man. Um, and to, to just, to have people say, you just don't get to do that. Just don't worry about it. it you know, it's off the table. That's a little bit dismissive because it, it, it is a big thing. It's another thing to grieve. Now, on the other hand, I don't think adoptive parents can be rigid about it either. Like this is what it's going to be. I think there has to be some flex and some give and some creativity. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, my dad, my adoptive dad named me and it was really important to him that I didn't have an H at the end of my name, um, that it was S-A-R-A. -A. And just, I'm very proud of my S-A-R-A. -A. And it's because it came from my beloved dad, you know, like, so there's like, there's that, you know, like, that's, it's wonderful. It's a great story and a great connection. And to feel that belonging <laughs> that I belong to my dad um, in a really significant way. Yeah. Yeah. Kelsey, what do you think there's some ways that um, an expectant mom and a, and a, a prospective adoptive mom and dad and, and may, perhaps an expectant father, how can they get creative to, um, to, to find that both and? Yeah, I've seen a lot of different things. I've seen um, where they they pick out one together and they do it. Um, they find a name that they all really like. Um, I've seen family names put in the middle name quite a quite a bit, um, whether it's birth mom's name or birth dad's name or um, a middle name that's being passed down. Um, and then I see. 
Yeah, I see sometimes too where they've they've taken a piece of adoptive family and biological family, and they've um, kind of like Used. merged, or they've um, put one of each in for the middle. I've seen. I think one of my favorite things that I've seen is when they each find um, a family member that they each have that carry the same name. And so it's like both, which I think that's kind of cool. Um, like if like if one if if birth mom has a family member, like their grandfather's name was Daniel, and then uh, adoptive family has a Daniel in their family that was important to them, and so now this child's name is Daniel, and I think that's like really cool to do that. If you can find it, of course, it doesn't exist for everyone, but um, yeah, I think that's pretty cool when they do that like that. Kelsey, I just, if you don't mind, I want to dial back um, just because I don't want, to, I didn't want to talk about my birth mom not naming me without circling back to the oh. big picture of yeah. how, um, and it, I hope you don't mind that I'm saying this, but you had shared that you hadn't named your son. And Correct. just in terms of like, what is, what's that psychology? And because I know there, it, it makes so much sense after you shared it. Um, yeah. Um, so when I was pregnant, I felt very like disconnected from my pregnancy, very numb, I would say is a good word to describe it. Um, and very like, you don't feel like you have the right to, I feel like some naming can be sort of like, like staking claim for lack of a better phrase. Um, but that's kind of how it felt at the time. And I didn't feel like I had the right to do that. Now I did. <laughs> But um, I think just the, the mental blocks that occur in, an, in a pregnancy where you're considering an adoption um, are kind of just so severe that you just don't, your power is just really um, diminished. And so I just didn't, I never knew I had that option. I never thought about naming him. Um, I never, it never crossed my mind because I kind of was in such a, a mode of like shaming myself. Cause I mean, I was, there's was plenty of shame by other people to get me wrong, but I was actively doing it to myself as well. Like felt like I was kind of just like giving myself a deserved punishment, I guess. Um, and so I think that that played a huge part in that reason why I didn't name him. I didn't feel like I could, didn't feel like I should um didn't feel really, really worthy of doing that and then the adoptive parents actually asked me um to they they asked me what I thought about these two names they were thinking of and I actually told them which one I preferred and that's his name now so I do feel like I had a little bit of a part in that um you know whether or not they took mine into consideration or whether it was a coincidence I don't really know but um, I also, when I look at him and I know his name, like he is that name to me and he always was. And when he was born, the nurse, I, I told them this is his name, um, that he's very much that to me. He's not, there is nothing else. Um, so I don't know. I don't know how he will feel about that someday. I guess um, I'll wait and see, <laughs> but yeah. That sounds like a gift to your son that you all love that name, yeah. claim that name. Yeah. There's a kind of a, a unity there. One of the mm -hmm. situations I sometimes hear about from adoptive parents is, and I don't know how the child was named in the background, but <clears throat> what I hear is, what do you do if the birth parents continue to call the child by a different name? What's a way for an adoptive parent to handle that? And I I would imagine that the whole conversation we're having right now is to try to get everybody on the same page to prevent that problem. But if you do have that problem, do you guys have anything to say about that? Well, there I do. Yeah. I, I actually do have an immediate, I have an immediate thought to that. And it's like, is that really a problem? You know, I mean, I'm thinking of grandparents who have many different names, depending on which grandkid is, is in their presence. <laughs> And so, um, 
you know, and I have different pet names for my kids than my husband has for the kids. Um, and I don't know, I mean, is there a way to just make sense of it as in that's your name for her? You know, I don't know. Um, again, because I think that when we get in that either or, and someone has to lose, like, and someone has to have the right answer, then the adoptee is the one who has to feel that divide. Um, I don't know, just a, a knee jerk thought. Kelsey, I find that really liberating because that means that perhaps we don't have, I like the way you framed it, because perhaps we as adoptive parents don't have to save our child from confusion because children don't get confused by the different names as you, as you pointed out. Yeah, I think that like anything else, it's just not a black and white thing. Um, I think, I, and ultimately, I think as the child grows, if the child doesn't want to be called whatever name that's their choice and everybody should respect that um I also have seen it, situations where the other name is kind of it's kind of spiteful and it's not really it's not a respectful other name it's like it's I think when we're doing things out of possessive nature that's when it gets to be kind of a toxic situation so on either side, um, I think that people can, I, I've also seen where adoptive parents, very rarely, but I have seen a couple occasions where adoptive parents have named the child something different after the finalization and, and not told the birth parent. And so now this birth parent doesn't even know the child's legal name, real name. So um, I've seen that as well. And I think any, anything can be done out of spite and then that's not um, a healthy move at all. Um, but yeah, I think ultimately you have to consider what's best for the child and the child can tell you what's best for the child um, in time, a lot of times, not always immediately when they're young, but I think that you can pretty much use some context clues even when they're young to see if that's something that they're comfortable with. Uh, hearing you you say that 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 never occurred to me that um, yeah like to to um, have possessiveness behind the name another thing it made me think of is um, naming adoptees things that um, kind of unconsciously put this the adoptee in a caretaking role for the adoptive parents I think that's something that's important to watch out for as in like, you know, I can't think of any off the top of my head I, without having the naming book or um, website up in front of me, but um, names like gold, you know, the, the meaning is golden child or <laughs> um, uh, great, you know, not grace, but you know, just names that kind of have that subliminal pressure of you're grateful and you're fulfilling our needs. <laughs> um, I've seen a lot of those, um, and I just, I, my heart goes out to the adoptees because I'm like, oh, it's all right. It's like it's right heavy there. load to carry. Yeah, that's not, that's not no. the child's load. Yeah. Yeah. I, there's another thing I want to talk about with names is that um, I saw when I worked at an agency before we offered adoptee counseling for like 20 years and they um, came across an adoptee who was at the time she was like a like preteen age and she was black living in a predominantly white community and her name was and then once again I'm not gonna say it for privacy reasons for her but it was a very very like it was a name you would find in a white rural community and it was not a name that you would typically name a black girl so she was in counseling specifically because the name was something she was not, it was just, um, it was hurtful to her to walk through life with this name, going to a school that um, didn't have very many black children, but the other black children, she really didn't feel included by them because she had this name. And then she also didn't really feel included by the white kids. and so. Um, I also think it's important as adoptive parents and birth parents to be very mindful of what you're naming these children and make sure it's an appropriate name for them um, that that's respectful of their, you know, culture and background. And we, you know, we need to be um, 
very intentional about that. So. That's a really good point that when you bring in anything um, that crosses racial lines, there's a lot, even a lot more to consider than trans family when you go transracial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's almost like the, that, that is the opposite of what this book, you know, like there's, there's cultural and racial um, significance here that's, it's honored. And it, this is not an adoption book, just to be clear. Um, it's a book about, um, you know, I'm assuming we don't, we don't know about the main character, actually, but um, but what you just described, Kelsey, there's no honoring of the culture. Um, yeah. it, and it could be in some cases, it could be like dishonoring, not just a neutral thing. It could be harmful. Um, and so, yeah, I just think if, in a child centered, I think you, we always have to check ourselves, even when we're not adoptive parents, even if I'm a parent uh, to biological children and I, I have to check myself like, is what I'm doing child centered. I think that's a checkpoint that all parents have to do. And it's it's similar in adoption with a little a heightened aspect, but um, you know, I don't want to name my daughter something inappropriate either. So yeah. Lori, I, I want to ask you a question um that just came to me. And I, I know your children are older now and not um you're you've kind of graduated <laughs> your children. Um, but if you were right now listening to the three of us and trying to weigh a big decision on naming, would this conversation give you, like, would this empower you? Would it make you nervous about naming or what, how would this land for you, do you think? That's a great question. It would, um, it would make me think because when I was back at the beginning of my journey, I just really wanted to name my child. I wanted this, part of my perfect situation was where I could name the child. And I didn't even have a pick, name picked out. I'm not, I'm not sure why that, it's, it's a big deal. It's a big deal about becoming a parent. Yeah. Um, but hearing from both of you, especially from um, the child who of course I wanted to be the best mom too I could and, and give them, all the uh, you know, do all the good things for them and none of the bad things and as both of you have said and then um you know our children's birth mothers who have grown to love to kind of see from their perspectives i think that would have um when everything was hypoth hypothetical i think this information would expand my view and help me see the reasons for becoming more both and more um flexible more creative um, so yeah, I think this would, I, I, th I think this would have, would save me, uh, a, a lot of, um, hardness, a lot of difficulty if I had, you know, really stuck to what I needed by the time we did meet, um, our children's birth parents, uh, we had softened in some ways. And, uh, once for me, once a, an expectant parent became real, it was really hard to make assumptions about them anymore. So they were real. They were there they were doing the best they could we were doing the best we could and um we all wanted the same thing which was a good relationship going forward and the best that we could do for for the child at the center mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i also I want to say i think a lot of couples face pressure from families i see this a lot more in the south when they face pressure from their own families to to keep certain names going um and to you know carry on you know names that have been through history that some of those and i and i especially can sympathize with them when they have faced infertility and this is you know this is what they're doing now to build their family and and they may not think like they may not want to carry on those family names but or it may not feel right, or it may be a conflict with the birth family or something like that. I think those families, those couples may need just permission to go a different way. Um, not from their families, but from themselves to say like, I'm breaking this tradition. It's okay. This is ultimately what's best for this child. We're going to, we're going to hold this child higher than a tradition that has been carried on through our family. And I think they may need that, um, need to just let themselves break free from that a little bit. To step into their power as parents and, 
yeah. Decision makers, yeah. That's important. One thing that occurred to me that we should just name, uh, no play on words or playing on words, um, is that the two of you are have are have a, the experience of open adoption. And I have the experience of closed adoption at the tail end of the baby scoop era. That's one of the things that we love is we have different generations of adoption too. Lori, you were kind of one of the pioneers in open adoption and your book is about that. Um, and so this is, we kind of have a little bit of a domestic bias right now because there are a lot of transracial adoptees and um parents who are adopting transracially who may not be in, there may be no means of contact or no, or even closed adoption in the US still, no means of contacting and working together on names um, and honoring of, of names, um, working together anyway, the, the togetherness may be foiled. I think with so many things in, in adoption and from my perspective as in adoptive parenting, one of the keys is really to be mindful and intentional about it. And so naming is such a, um, an early and a good example of being intentional. And Kelsey, when you were talking about people, uh, the two sets of parents working together to find out what was important to each of them, that presumes that each person knows what's important to themselves because they've got some sort of ability to tune in and articulate why you want this, what this is, why this is important. And then also the ability to hear openly with openness from the other person without judgment, without constriction. And that's where the creativity and the, the playground for finding something that works for everybody. That's when, when we have that sense of openness within, within us and between us, that's when the, the magic and the beauty can happen. Yeah, I agree. And that may not be there. I mean, a lot of, um, yeah, that, I, yeah, there's, there's trauma. Yeah, I think in right like inter-country adoptions and stuff like that, I, I, I guess I hesitate to engage in that conversation because I do feel like it would be best left to inter-country adoptees and, um, you know, people that have experienced that. I feel, I mean, from what I see, see out there the conversations happening I see a lot of um I've seen a few I get Korean adoptees who have um taken um a name for themselves later in life that is a Korean name and whether they put that as their first name or their middle name um I've seen that happen um I've but most of the time in those adoptions, you know, you don't have access to the birth family at all. Um, and so that makes it really tough to integrate in that way. But I, I have seen families um, find a name that is maybe of like high regard in their culture or something like that. Um, but I don't know. I, I don't really, I guess I don't feel authority to speak on it. I don't think know? we should speak on it for sure. Okay. Um, and I think we should just acknowledge that that is a dynamic that needs yeah, consideration sure. when you're doing all of this um, thoughtful, critical thinking that um, if that's your situation, it, that needs to be thought through just as carefully. Yeah. 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 Anything else? Is there anything else we want to say? I feel like there's, there is more, but <laughs> any other thoughts on names? We covered a lot of ground. It's an important and early topic. Yeah. 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 Well, this was wonderful. Thanks for, thanks for doing this and, uh, and uh, talking together as on this topic. And we have lots of other topics we want to talk about. So uh, yeah, if you'd we'll like to throw something in the mix for us to talk about, put it in the comments. Yeah, that'd be great. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. everybody.